Well, I'm excited for a new series. Judges was a lot of, of fun and, and a blessing, um, but we need a little Jesus, right? So we're going to start a series on following Jesus, and this is going to be a message friendly to note-takers, or maybe a burden for note-takers. I think there's a lot of notes. I've got kind of a lot of outline stuff here for you. Um, so if you like to write, um, I'll help you out. You can add in whatever you want, but I have plenty of things I'm suggesting today. And let me just show you right where we're headed. Um, three sections for the message today. First of all, choosing the right Jesus. Now, I'll very shortly explain what I mean by that. And then we're going to talk about that Jesus, the Jesus of a grand mission. And I believe it's the same Jesus of a great commission. And we're going to spend some time in that last section in Matthew chapter 28 and the great commission of the disciples Jesus, given by Jesus himself. All right, well, let's start with choosing the right Jesus. The first challenge we face in, choosing, in following Jesus is choosing a Jesus to follow. Because it seems to me that there are all sorts of Jesuses. Is Jesuses a word, by the way? I wrote it down, and it sure looked funny to me. There are all sorts of followers of Jesus, of Jesus today because there are all sorts of Jesuses being followed. And I would say there are at least three. At least I kind of came up with an outline of three. And you get to pick which one you want to follow. Is that how it works? Not exactly, but it seems like people kind of do that. So we'll start with choosing the right uh, Jesus. Well, the first Jesus that people like to follow, I would call the Jesus of likable character qualities. The Jesus of likable uh, char character qualities. Jesus, the idea of this one is Jesus was a wonderful teacher. He was a wonderful man, a wonderful healer, and a wonderful uh, man with wonderful character qualities. There are a lot about him. You might see somebody today that you'd say, wow, that guy is a neat guy. I like his or, or her character qualities, and I want to be like them. And that's what people today believe it means to follow Jesus. They uh, want to affirm and maybe even adopt the qualities of of Jesus. And in doing so, they want to de-emphasize, this view would want to de-emphasize and maybe even outright deny the divine nature of Jesus or anything about a, a virgin birth or a literal resurrection or any of that silly stuff, right? But they like the guy. They like what he kind of, the, the principles that he lived by, uh, maybe he was the son of God in some sense, uh, but who cares about the details, right? Let's get to these character qualities that I kind of like in Jesus. Jesus was giving, I want to be giving. Jesus was kind, I want to be kind. Jesus was humble and compassionate, I want to be humble and compassionate. In this view, oftentimes, goes pretty wild with, with things, and it might say something like this. Jesus uh, was loving and accepting of people, so I'm going to define loving and accepting as celebrating whatever people want to do, even if it flies in the face of God's laws, because I like Jesus, and I want to be like Jesus, so that sounds odd to me. Or they might say, Jesus was forgiving. And Jesus being forgiving means he didn't really worry that much about what people did. He was willing to kind of forgive whatever they would do. Um, so Jesus kind of got away from the notion of, of sin. I'm not going to concern myself with the notion of sin. Um, that would be judgy. Jesus was not judgy um, except against religious leaders. So I think it's okay, this view is, I think it's okay to be judgy of religious leaders who talk about sin. And they somehow make this a... Oops. So I, I guess I was on that last one. Sorry. Um, I'm still on it. Um, I don't think that's a view of Jesus that most of us 
would think is the biblical Jesus. This is what it means. Is that what it means to follow Jesus? You pick out character qualities you prefer to see in Jesus and that resonate with the winds of culture. That's not the right one either. Terry, I love, love the facial responses. Not happening. I'm with you, Terry. All right. A second Jesus. Uh-oh. It's telling me to restart. Look at that. Sean, I'm getting so smooth I could just relax and wait for it to come back. Get her moving again. The second one would be the Jesus of select social causes. The Jesus of select social causes. This one's interesting to me, too. Well, this one says, Jesus fed hungry people and healed needy people. He was gracious and thoughtful toward women. He cared for the outsider and had compassion for the lost. Well, those things sound like social activism to me. Well, Jesus was a social activist fighting systems of oppression, right? God wants us to be social activists for the earth and for humanity, right? That's the way people are following Jesus today. Uh, we live in a day, I would say, of select. I use that word for a reason. Select social causes. They usually happen to fall right along political or ideological lines. So you pick the Jesus who agrees with your ideology or political views, and you say, that's the Jesus that I'm uh, going to follow. Strangely, um, those who prefer the social cause Jesus, this is my own opinion, they never seem to include the Holocaust of our time the slaughter of the unborn. Now, listen, I do realize a lot of Christians do uh, desire to protect the unborn and uh, make that an important cause. But I'm saying people that adopt a social cause Jesus, where that's kind of the Jesus that they, that they follow, concern for the unborn is never in the mix. They would never... Um, show a movie that would be supporting the cause for the unborn, like the movie Unplanned, they'd be more likely at the Al Ringling to show the movie Flint, the poisoning of the American city with lead, lead on lead poisoning. But they'd never show the movie down at the Al Ringling on Unplanned and the Holocaust of the abortion today. And then there's a third one. This is just my introduction here. We have the Jesus of unseen heavenly realities. Those are loaded words, right? The Jesus of unseen heavenly realities. Do you know this Jesus? Do you know the Jesus of the Bible? Do you know what Jesus was like in the Bible, how he lived his life? This third one is going to be the one that I believe is the Jesus of the Bible and the one that we ought uh, to follow. Did Jesus have wonderful character qualities? How many of you th thought Jesus had wonderful character qualities that provide an example for us? Um, did Jesus have a beautiful love for the outcast and compassion for the lost that we should duplicate? Absolutely, right? Less hands for that one. No, I'm sorry. I was getting rhetorical sounding, wasn't I? Even as my hand was raised. But... Even in his beautiful example of his character qualities, even in his wonderful care for the causes and the compassion that he showed for the people of his day, do you know what made Jesus tick? Do you know what he was all about? His absolute primary mission. What was Jesus up to? And that's what we're going to look at next. Choosing the right Jesus. You have a Jesus of a grand mission. What did Jesus come to do according to the New Testament? The Jesus of a grand mission was all about a spiritual kingdom. What did Jesus teach about? Somebody say it to me. What was he always talking about in his teaching? Huh? The kingdom of heaven. Absolutely. The kingdom of heaven. He's always talking about the 
kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Right when he showed up on the scene from the time Jesus began to preach, he, he was saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then as he went from place to place, he was bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the 12 disciples were going out with him. And then when he commissioned them, he told them the, uh, to proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There are a ton of verses. You could spend all day trying to look up all the verses, and you just keep finding another one. Jesus was constantly talking about the kingdom of heaven. He was talking about another kingdom. And when people would talk to him about the kingdom here, he would, he would say, I'm not of this kingdom, right? Even as Pilate and the others were holding to him a counter, you, well, it's a different kingdom. I am here to represent heaven. Jesus spent a lot of time talking about heaven. That's what we'd call it today, wouldn't we? We don't usually say the kingdom of heaven. We refer to it just as heaven itself. Jesus talked about it all the time. Do you ever talk about heaven? Do you talk about heaven? Do you, Tiffany? That's awesome. I just wonder if we talk about it enough. You know, that'd be a place in ministry to your neighbors or to your friends or your co-workers. I don't think people would be outright offended at the mention of heaven, right? Jesus was incredibly heavenly-minded even as he was doing wonderful earthly things, wasn't he? He had that connection. I hope that you might be unleashed to talk about heaven with other people, and that God might lead you to just start talk about heaven. You know, there's another place talking about not just when you're going to die, but I mean, that certainly is a wonderful time to just reflect on what we're here about it has everything to do uh, with heaven. Jesus talked about heaven all the time. Now, are there things to talk about the here and now, social causes that we ought to jump in and help with? Absolutely. I'm not saying don't engage social causes today. We talked about uh, sex trafficking and homelessness. Um, I've got a passion I've really enjoyed reading over the last year or two on uh, world poverty and how that happens. And I mean, I, I, I love it when Christians engage social causes. But your first cause, your primary concern is whether people are making it to heaven, right? I love David Platt. I mentioned him last week with his ministry to the uh, indigenous peoples in the Himalayan mountains. Remember that? And they were trafficking and they didn't see any girls in the village from age 8 to 20 because they were being trafficked. I just love watching David Platt talk about that mission trip because he's very concerned about their human causes and the human suffering they're engaging. But you can't listen to David Platt without him getting their primary concern, their primary problem is the need for eternal life. They need salvation to be found in Jesus. And just the way he talks with such grief that they don't know their Lord yet. People that get so caught up in social causes oftentimes don't have the primary stuff down. They don't understand that Jesus came to speak of another kingdom. That was his, his primary concern, that you might enter in to the kingdom of God. So as he discussed it, it was all about a personal faith. All right, what did Jesus talk about? A spiritual kingdom, one, and then two, a personal faith. He was concerned about the hearts of people. He talked about the kingdom. I liked one teacher that I had a long time ago now, but he would say, Jesus talked about the kingdom of, of heaven or the kingdom of God. But then as he went from person to person, he would address their kingdom issue. The rich young ruler, what was his kingdom issue, his struggle with money, right? Or the, the gal that, uh, the woman at the well, you know, relationships in her life. With others, religious leaders, it was hypocrisy. With some, it was unforgiveness, and he would tell stories to help them with their kingdom issue, but it was individuals and their need to respond personally to his message. I love John 6, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever ever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you, 
uh, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. He wanted them to believe. You know what he had just done with these people? He had just fed them. He had compassion on the crowds, thousands of people, and he fed them. But then they just started following him around, wanting food. And you know what Jesus was saying? That's not what I'm here to do. Yes, I'm here to alleviate human suffering, and I'm going to establish a kingdom where it'll be gone, like what Tyson said a little bit earlier. I'm looking forward to that kingdom being fully established and realized, right? No more colds. Wouldn't that be nice? Tyson hit me with that one. I'm like, yeah. Although I haven't had one this year. I've decided not to have a cold <laughs> this year. And uh, what's that? Go hang out with your children. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Jesus was concerned about physical needs. But he said it was, you, you, the reason I'm doing that is so you'd understand your spiritual needs. With those who wanted food, that's what he said. With healing, why did he say I'm healing? He said, I'm healing so that you may know that I can do what? Forgive sins, right? I'm doing, I'm doing things here. Keep doing things here. I'm not telling you to stop doing all these wonderful things you're doing. But I'm saying if you get it in balance, the Jesus that we follow, he had a primary concern. Spiritual truth, spiritual realities. And individuals needed to respond, that call to believe sent his son, God sent his son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Who said that? Those are the words of who? Jesus. Jesus is the one that says John 3.16, right? And then John recorded it. Again in verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Jesus talked that way. The world loves it when Christians go and serve and do something nice. But they say, keep that Jesus uh, stuff to yourself. I'm not making this up. I had somebody come in this week. And I said, boy, that's funny. I am really planning to preach on this. But I had a guy come in this week in my office, so burdened, because he's been involved in a Christian ministry, and he says, we've taken out the message. I've been a part of a Christian ministry doing wonderful things for people, but they've made the conscious decision. Now, I understand in the public arena and a lot of arenas, we're told to keep your message to yourself. But he's saying, here is a Christian ministry. There's no outside group. There's no government agency feeding us money that we have to be careful not to offend. He said, and, and this ministry is making the conscious decision that we just want to do nice things. We want to be Jesus in, in doing nice things, but we don't want to share the message. There will be no call uh, to personal faith. That wasn't what Jesus was about. A third part of Jesus' mission was uh, eternal consequence. It was always there, and I guess I'm kind of already saying that when he's talking about heaven and the kingdom of heaven wherever he went. But of course... He also talks about hell. Who talks about hell more than anyone? Jesus does. Most of our theology of hell comes from the very words of Jesus, and this isn't one of those passages, but an explanation of the kind of teaching Jesus gave. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. So not everyone who claims to be my follower. We would say today, not everybody who claims to be a Christian. He says will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Jesus was always talking about things of eternal consequence. Everything that he did and everything that he said, it was like he was always going to heaven and he was always bringing up the consequence of hell. Well, I'm going to share just a touch about this. But it's interesting. The way Jesus lived his life, it was like he was drawing out the question, who is this guy? 
What's his identity? What is he really all about? And the way Mark in particular, but all the Gospels do that, they kind of draw out the question, who is this guy, right? The masses of people are all amazed. And Mark just says it over and over again. And the people were amazed. And the people were amazed. The people were amazed. The disciples are confused. I had a girl yesterday, where was I at? A youth wrestling tournament. And she was going like that with her hair. And I said, are you curling your hair or are you calling me crazy? <laughs> and she kind of looked at me, which kids often do. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Do kids still do that? Is that still mean you're crazy? Maybe with all the anti-bullying, you, people don't even do this anymore. But the disciples couldn't figure it out, right? And they're, this is a theme in Mark. You know, the, the masses are amazed. The disciples are in Jesus saying, why are you so dull? You know, why, why are you hearing, but you can't comprehend? You know, he's just kind of drawing them out, picking on them a little, like, come on, come on, you need to think, you need to think. And, of course, the religious leaders are wanting to kill. The only ones that understand Jesus' true identity are the who. And they just declare it. It's the demons, right? The evil spirits, wherever they go, they just declare it. And even when they declare it, it's just funny. You just read the first four chapters of Mark, and it's funny how many times Jesus goes, shh, don't tell who I am. Don't do it. He's, I, don't th- I don't think Jesus is saying that to our Christian ministries today, just so you know that. But when he was ministering, you couldn't understand who he was. The full revelation, the full unveiling of the mystery of the identity of Jesus would come after his atoning death, and more specifically, after his defeating of death in his resurrection. I just did provide one verse there, but Jesus at the end there, uh, verse 25, but Jesus rebuked him. This is Mark 1, 25, but re- Jesus rebuked the demon saying, be silent and come out of him, right? The mystery of Jesus' identity could not be understood until the culminating event of his atoning work. Jesus came and, yeah, did nice things, talked a lot about the kingdom of God, got everybody provoked in their thinking and directing a lot of attention to himself, but a lot of shh, a lot of mystery to it. And even as he took the elements of the meal and consumed them, the confusion that would have been there amongst his disciples, we talk about that once a month. Then it wasn't until he went to the cross and offered himself up, fulfilling what was said about him 700 years before, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. And with the understanding of what Jesus did in dying for our sins on the cross, he who knew no sin, becoming sin for us on that cross, Then when he encountered his disciples on the other side of the resurrection, it was a little different conversation, wasn't it? Do you remember with the two fellows on the road to Emmaus? It's just a fun story, right? Here's Jesus walking. You know, people don't, they didn't see him every day. It's it's like, well, I'm pretty bad with celebrity faces and things. I really don't know who these people are. I mean, I know some sports figures I know better. But these people say, oh, there's some famous guy. And my wife will be like, oh, well, that's, so-and-so. I mean, everybody knows who that is. But in the days of Jesus, they wouldn't have known what he looked like, right? And of course, he was veiling himself in some way too. But he finally reveals himself. But look in their conversation. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. So there's no more shush going on, right? He's revealing just what's going on, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning 
from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. That sounds a lot like Acts 1.8 to me. They got their little great commission on an individual basis. Isn't that pretty awesome? These guys get to a little bit of the, you're going to be my witnesses of these things. And the Holy Spirit's going to come, right? And so that leads us right into that great commission. All right, that's what the true Jesus has these elements. And you could probably add others too, right? But the true Jesus has commissioned his followers to say something. Not just to do nice things. Yes, to do nice things. But to say something. So we serve the Jesus of a great commission, a grand mission, but also a great commission. And I want to spend the remainder of our time, short time, in the great commission. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Oh, I'm going to have to talk about that in a second, aren't we? And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. All right, the real Jesus, the real Jesus that we just looked at from his entire life and ministry is the same Jesus that commissioned his disciples to go and tell. Well, what do I see in the Great Commission about this Jesus? The Jesus of the Great Commission, first of all, is what? He's worthy of worship. He's worthy of worship. And when they gathered together, you know, on this, this mount, the uh, Mount of Olives, they gathered, they worshiped him, but some doubted. I think that's, that strikes me as weird, right? I would think at this point they would all be worshiping, but some doubted. Most worship, some doubted. I think the whole doubting thing could lead you down a trail of just wanting to talk about, oh, why, why would somebody doubt at that stage? Why would somebody? To me, I think of this a little differently. I think, do you serve a Jesus? Do you follow a Jesus who could be doubted? Right? Do you follow a Jesus who could be worshipped? And could be doubted. I would say the Jesus of likable character qualities, he's neither worshipped nor is he doubted. It's not hard. You don't, what do you doubt about a guy that's just going around being a nice guy? You can say, well, I doubt he's as nice as he came across. Okay. Okay, maybe that's true. Um, no, this Jesus was to be worshipped. He was worthy of worship. You don't doubt a Jesus who has likable character qualities or is caring for poor people. You doubt a Jesus who is God. You doubt a Jesus of a resurrected... Uh, you doubt a, a resurrected Jesus, a resurrected king of a spiritual kingdom. Can the Jesus that you point to be doubted? If he can't, then which Jesus are you following? And which Jesus are you pointing to? If he can't be doubted, are you pointing to a Jesus who is God? Are you pointing to a Jesus who is a spiritual king of a spiritual kingdom? I hope that point made sense. Well, the Jesus of the Great Commission also possesses all authority. Was that made pretty clear? Before the Great Commission, we usually start with go. The Great Commission starts with, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. I don't think that's a big point for the likable character qualities, Jesus. 
I don't think that's a big point for the social cause, Jesus. The Jesus of unseen spiritual realities is king. And he holds absolute authority over everyone. He became obedient to death so that every knee would bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Well, the Jesus of the Great Commission does what we usually think of with the Great Commission. He sends out his followers. He sends out his followers. So we don't just follow him in following his example. We follow his commands. We follow his directives. He tells us what to do. Go there. What does he tell us to do? Go, therefore, and make disciples. Go and make disciples. All right? And sometimes people uh, today question, that was borderline miraculous. I don't know how you crush a cup that bad and not knock it over. Not very well placed, but I won't try it again. The go in the Greek here isn't actually an imperative. It's a participle. It's just It's like in your goings. So in your goings, make disciples. And yet, the commentators show it's kind of implied, though, because you don't just happen to get to all nations, right? We're called to go. You're to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I think if you take Acts 1-8 in there, he's telling some to go. I mean, just in your goings, but some make the commitment to really go throughout the earth. The disciples of Jesus are meant to go. To do what? To make disciples. When Jesus called his first followers, what did he tell them he was going to make them do? Make them fishers of men. That was good. I didn't ask the question very well, but you knew right where I was going. Go be fishers of men. We're going to go fishing. We're going to find other followers. The followers of Jesus make other followers. That's a little different than the Jesus of likable character qualities or get into business with uh, social, just get into business with social causes. Go make disciples. Got to get through my outline. Almost there. And those disciples are first baptized disciples, right? Now, I don't, we don't have any time to talk about baptism here. But just to say that was the initiatory right or the initiatory uh, commitment. You were making your commitment to follow Jesus. So when they were to go and make disciples of all nations, they would call them to a commitment to follow Jesus in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's not just get baptized to follow some Jesus. It's the one of the Trinity, the one with right doctrine. And then finally, he sends out his followers to make disciples, obedient disciples. The followers of Jesus obey him. So we're not just going out just to make converts, right? We're not just going out to tell people, hey, trust in Jesus. You agree to it? Great. I'm going to get back to what I was doing now. In making disciples, we teach them to follow the commandments of Jesus. So this series on following Jesus, we had to establish that we're going to follow the right Jesus. The rest of the series is going to be his commands. What has Jesus commanded us to do? If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you have to figure out who the right Jesus is. And following him isn't just trying to imitate some of the things that you like that he did. We take our orders from our king. He's earned the right to be called our king, and we follow. 
the good news is we're not alone. Is Jesus here with us? In one sense, he left. But he's left his spirit with us. And in that sense, he can say, I'm right there with you. Even to the end of the age, followers of Jesus Christ have Jesus there with him, leading us in our path. And with that, I'm going to conclude with the reading of a short poem. I feel kind of bad. I've read this poem before, and I attributed it to the wrong person. I attributed it to one of our old pastors from the 1800s, from the 1860s. He got off the battlefield of Antietam, the bloodiest war in American history. And he came and he became our pastor for a short while. Amazing man. That was the Civil War, of course. And I said this was his poem. I just was looking it up again. I was going to read it because I remembered. It wasn't his poem. It was his wife's poem. We have a poem. Is that cool or what? From a pastor's wife of this church from the 1860s. And it's got a lot of the themes from the message today. I'm pretty sure she liked to follow Jesus. You want to hear it? Well, we ran out of time. Man, listen to this. Oh, I can't believe I thought that was her husband. He couldn't have come up with a poem like this. All right, read it. Fear not, the master sendeth thee. Go forth, his word obey. Who touched, the coal, who touched with coal the prophet's lips will arm thee for the fray. Speak warning words to sinful men. The strain child reclaim. Lift high the banner of the cross. Proclaim his right to reign. And uh, thou shalt feel his presence near to comfort and to cheer. And his well done finds sweeter far than praise the world holds dear. Isn't that beautiful? They were following the same Jesus that we're following today. It's a beautiful thing. Amen? Stand with me. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, if your son was right, and I think he was, I know he was. He's king. And we are his followers. Lord, there are murky waters today. We're in murky waters. And we want to hear the clarity from the King. And we want to hear it straight from Him. So this series, Lord, I pray that it might be a blessing to this body, to this church. We would be blessed to be uh, thinking about what Jesus actually taught, what He actually said, what He wanted of His followers. Bless us, Lord, as we attempt to follow faithfully. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And all God's people said, amen. amen.